Hello everyone, welcome to Aptera Owners Club. In this video, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, solar panels and in particular perovskite solar panels because um, I'm sure many of you have seen the uh, videos on YouTube about perovskite uh, solar panels. And if you watch those videos, it makes it seem like perovskite is gonna be the answer to um, all the problems with solar panels and that we're gonna have super efficient solar panels that are really cheap. Uh, very soon and that solar cars will become very common and um, you know we might get you know like triple the range out of solar out of uh, the Aptera once we uh, convert over to perovskite um, solar cells but after kind of researching it a little bit I realized that that's probably not the case now uh, caveat before we get started to the field I am not a physicist or an engineer um, but uh, I've uh, read over it, and I think I have a pretty good understanding of how this thing works, um, at least uh, in layman's terms. So to start, we know that um, that probably Aptera is using the SunPower Maxion solar cells, which are 22.7% efficient, which is really good for commercial cells. Uh, it's a pretty good commercial cell. There, there aren't very many commercial cells that have higher efficiency than this. So that's what they've picked um, are the Maxion cells. So let's go over these... Uh, uh, perovskites uh, videos and we'll talk about some of the things that are not uh, misleading on purpose but you kind of get the feeling that um, that it's going to be the end all so here's one from um, undecided with matt farrell which I, I think is a great channel i enjoy his videos reports of about three percent in 2006 to over 29 percent today okay so that makes it seem like you know, in, in less than a few decade or so, it's gone from 3% to 29%. So, oh my goodness, in another decade, it's going to be like 60%. Uh, that, that's just not, that's probably not possible. Um, and that has to do with uh, Shockley-Quasar limit. This is the paper by William Shockley and Hans Quasar. Basically, uh, so if you, if you guys don't know, William Shockley and a couple other people were the inventors of the transistor at Bell Labs. Um, back in the uh, 60s. Um, and basically in this paper, he talks about the maximum uh, efficiency that you would expect from a solar panel based on its band gap. And uh, they calculated 30% for a, a silicon. Because silicon has a band gap of 1.1 EV. Now, what, what does that really mean? Um... Let me go over that. So I think this is the um, kind of the best video on YouTube on this. And unfortunately it has 52 views, but it's by uh, Professor David Cahan from the Weissman Institute in Israel. And um, it's an hour long video. So it's a little bit uh, dense, but if you have any interest in it, uh, I would recommend watching the whole video. But basically what it means is the way solar uh, panels work is that the material has what's called a band gap, which is the amount of energy that it takes for the electron in the material to jump up to a higher um, electron level so that it becomes conductive. So basically in a semiconductor, the, the electron is in its valence shell, which is it's stable. It won't move away from its atom. But when it gets excited, it can be excited up to the conduction shell, and then it can move around and become electricity. So like, let's say that this is your band gap right here. And so any photon, so these photons, so the, across here is more photon energy. Any photon that does not reach the band gap will not be absorbed by the cell because it just doesn't have enough energy to, um, to push the electron out into the conduction shell. And then any um, photon that has more energy than the band gap, basically it will excite it, but any energy beyond the band gap, it just gets wasted as heat because it can't pick it up. So then you're like, if you, if you fix the band gap here, then you'll get a lot more energy per photon, but there's so few photons that have that level of energy that you, you won't absorb like most of the thing. If you set your band gap here, then you'll absorb every, all the uh, every photon will have at least will have enough energy 
to send you to the conduction shell, but you, each, each photon will have so little energy that you'll get almost no energy out of it. So basically, wherever you move this, your own, the power out becomes like a box, and the, the area of the box is going to be relatively uh, stable, because no matter where you go in here, the box stays kind of the same size. So it'll, it'll be more square here, more rectangular here, more rectangular here. But you can't, you can't make it so that it's across the whole thing. Now, there is a way to make it. Um, to do that, to absorb at all the different band gaps. And that has to do with, if you look at this graph, look at the thing that is the most, um, the most efficient. It's right here. It's this thing with the, uh, with the square in the box, which is a four junction or more concentrator. So they're basically putting a lens on it to concentrate the solar. And you get this, or if you want an unconcentrated one, I think, let's see, it's the square box here. It's 40% here. And how do they get this? It's, a, it's called a multi-junction sh uh, shell, and here's how it works. What they're doing is they're stacking different materials on this solar panel, and they have different band gaps. So uh, 2.1, 1.7, 1.4, 1.2, uh, 0.5, 0.5. Six nine. Okay, so basically, like this one will absorb a lot of electrons, but each electron will have very little. Uh, excuse me, a lot of photons, but each photon will have very little um, energy, so it won't get very much. So you wouldn't want this, and this one would. Each photon will give you a lot of energy, but very few photons have that much energy. So if we go back to here, it's like that first layer would c capture these. And then the second layer would capture these, the second layer would, and the third layer would capture these, and the fourth and the fifth. So basically, you can imagine that there's multiple boxes in here. And if you add up all the boxes, then you get a lot more efficiency. And then even within the box, you know, obviously you're going to lose, there's some other, beyond the thermalization and not, uh, not absorption, there's other processes that make it less efficient. So you'll never have 100% efficiency, obviously. 50% is thought to be really, really good. And um, so in this multi-junction cell, the light will come in, the high energy photons will be absorbed by this layer and converted to electricity. Then the next layer will be converted to this, the next highest energy photons will be captured by this, and then this, and then this, and it just goes through. And so there's six layers. So we're like, well, why don't we do this? Well, the reason is, is look at the materials that are in here. It's like ga ga um, gallium, indium, phosphate, uh, gallium arsenide. These are like expensive materials, hard to work with, and then you got to stack them in six layers. It's really, really hard. And I think this um, this cell is like less than a square centimeter in size. So you can't scale this commercially. And it, even if you did, it would be extremely, extremely expensive. So like not not viable commercially. So that's why this multi-junction um, technology is interesting in the lab. Um, and you can get very efficient cells this way, but it's not commercially viable because it's so expensive. So unless there's some big technological advances in uh, making these materials cheaper or using a different uh, material that's easier to get, and then also in manufacturing these multiple layer multi-junction cells, it, this is not gonna be commercially viable. And that's why um, we don't talk about these in commercial applications. Now, what makes perovskite um, interesting is that it is, uh, it is, it's cheap and it's easy to manufacture. So here's another one from uh, Tubit Da Vinci. Here's what he says. Further market proliferation. Enter perovskite. Perovskite is a calcium titanium oxide mineral and one of the most common crystal structures on the planet. Okay, so uh, he's like not exactly right. Um, so it, here's a... Um, this is from MIT. This is a PhD candidate talking about uh, pushing the efficiency limit of lead halide perovskite solar cells. So actually, the perovskite solar cells right now are not calcium titanium oxide. They are um, an organic lead halide perovskite. So he, he, he uh, kind of discusses it here. Now, if we uh, zoom in with the microscope, um, we'll see that it has the following uh, crystal structure. 
and the type of props type that we're interested in for uh, various uh, object, object electronic property uh, devices is a let hay like props guide. Okay, so this calcium titanium oxide is the most common uh, perovskite in the mantle of the earth, but a, a perovskite is any crystal that has this structure, A, B, X to X3. So this A can be anything, and this B can be anything, and X can be anything. Well, actually, you know, it has to be a, two cations and, a, and, a, and an anion. So in this case, what they have is an organic compound, and then lead, and then a halide. Oh, so halides are like bromide, iodide, that kind of stuff. And these things are the ones that are used in um, the perovskite solar cells. So this is just the structure. The structure is this. It's like a diamond with a central core of lead. And then this is the organic portion. And the organic portions can uh, be anything. Where the, uh, the A side cation, um, such as methyl ammonium or pomimidium, is surrounded by an octahedral cage composed of lead and halide. And with all that, yeah, so these browns are the halides and the leads in the middle, and then this is the organic compound. So th that's one of the major problems of perovskite is that it has lead in it, and that's a big problem. And th this is the other thing that's like kind of funny. Um, if you listen to uh, this video, it has a band gap of 1.5, but okay, we'll still back. not ideal. Perovskite, then, it has a band gap of 1.5 electron volts, making it even better than ideal. As a Okay, so you can't have it better than ideal. 1.4 is the ideal band gap. Okay, yeah. So if you look here, um, this is the Shockley Quasar limit. Um, you see that the ideal band gap is like 1.4, it's right here. 1.5, that's when the efficiency starts dropping off. So it's not like 2.5 is way better than 1.4, which is the ideal band gap. And 1.5 is not better than 1.4. Okay, 1.4 right here is um, just a better a band gap. This it's it's in this area. 1.5 you're starting to drop off, so that's not that's not correct. And lastly, in this video, um, he talks about this thing where they are getting rid of lead because lead is a big problem in perovskite, and they he talks about how there's a 27 percent efficiency with um, with uh, this tin-based perovskite. But if you look at the actual article, it says performance optimization of lead-free um, perovskite-based solar cell with 27% efficiency by numerical simulation. So this is a simulation. If you look at actual, um, so this is a, the highest efficiency perovskite right now is about 29% with a tandem silicon and lead perovskite cell. But uh, for tin, hal tin halide cells, their current maximum is 13%. They, they haven't, um, they, there's nothing even close to 25%. See right here, the open circuit improved up to 24.4% efficiency. So that is the best efficiency of a tin perovskite so, um, cell. So we're far, far away from matching um, uh, lead perovskite or solar cells, uh, silicon cells. So I think what what we need to understand is that this is a physics limit, and um, it, you know you're not going to get um, efficiencies beyond thirty percent, uh, much beyond thirty percent, without stacking um, and having um, having multiple band gaps within the thing. Now, one of the uh, one of the improvements is that you can have a tunable band gap. So you can tune the um, perovskite uh, to different band gaps. And so you could simulate uh, this multiple layer thing maybe in a single phase. Now, I, I'm not enough of an engineer or physicist to know if that's possible, but maybe it's possible that if you mix the different uh, band gaps into a liquid phase and, and make a uh, perovskite solar cell with multiple band gaps within it, maybe it will capture more solar energy. I don't know. That would be very interesting to know. Um, but um, if you watch those videos, the downsides of the perovskite is that there's a couple. There are 
toxic um, solvents that are used in the manufacture and has lead in it. And the biggest, the other big problem is very unstable. Um, they don't last very long. Silicon cells last like 25, 35 years. Uh, these things last like hours to maybe a few months currently. So until they fix those problems, um, these things aren't going to be uh, the answer to um, our problems. Um, if you guys know more about these perovskite uh, solar cells, please comment below and educate all of us. Thanks for watching.